Alrighty. So, well, on Monday we talked about indexes, and we talked about how we could take advantage of data organization to make our queries run a little bit faster. Uh, today we'll be talking about pretty much the same thing, but we'll be talking about different types of organization. Uh, before I get into that, however, uh, I would like to remind everyone that uh, Project Checkpoint 1 is due Sunday night. Um, if there are any final questions, uh, now would be the time to ask them. Yes? So the working, uh, the question is, can I extend the due date? Uh, the answer is uh, no. However, um, I'm playing around with the uh, possibility of having a secondary due date uh, a week later with a grade penalty. Um, I will try and figure out the logistics of that. And if something goes through, I will notify you by Friday. Uh, for now, please assume that the due date will be uh, Sunday. Uh, regardless, the, uh, there will not be a uh, pen penalty-free extension. Um, any other questions? Yes? That's correct. Uh, the eight queries that were, uh, there is a specific um, file on Piazza that contains all of the, all eight uh, queries used by the grading script. Uh, checkpoint two will have additional uh, test queries. Checkpoint one, if you pass those queries, uh, that is sufficient. The data will be changing, however. I I don't believe that there are any queries that use union. That's correct. Any other questions? Yes. Would you consider uh, having some easier DPCH queries because the DPCH queries are very the easier ones, as in the checkpoint two or the checkpoint one? The checkpoint one. Those are the easy ones. <laughs> Um, no, those, those queries, I think the hardest thing in there is order by, um, date, I mean, you do have to use a couple of non-standard data types, but, uh, the bulk of the TPCH workload, uh, involves all sorts of craziness, like, uh, having nested queries, uh, between, um, checkpoint two is really, if, if you're having trouble with, uh, the three, the four TPCH queries, now you're, uh, you're going to have considerably more trouble with checkpoint two, which is due a month and a half from now, or which will be due a month and a half from now. Uh, any other questions? Or is there like a specific uh, issue that you're having with one or more of the queries? Or is it just a matter of uh, feature complexity? Yeah, it's because of some queries, so here's here's a question. Uh, never any chalk here. So here's a, a question. If I'm implementing uh, a nested query in the from clause. Uh, Let's say I have the following query. Okay, straightforward query. What would the uh, relational algebra plan for this look like?
Join. Mark. And S. Or I guess I should use the proper terminology of cross product. And then selection. Okay. Now, how would you implement this operator? Scanner. Right. So this is going to scan over the, the tuples in one file. Now, if you've been following along, what I've been encouraging you guys to do is to implement all of these operators as self-contained, isolated pieces of code. In the case of a file scan operator, it simply produces a stream of tuples that you can iterate over. Now, if I, assuming that you did implement this as an isolated black box component, the cross product operator shouldn't care what's sitting under here. So if I implement, if I just have a black box there, does it matter whether I'm reading from a file or whether I'm reading from A selection. So it may seem challenging, but if if you look at everything as just mapping down to a set of relational operators, you can com the idea is that you can compose all of them uh, very easily. And if as long as you have a piece of code that takes a selection predicate maps it down to a set of relational operators, that's all you need to do. Just map whatever is in that selection predicate down to a relational operator here and plug that in instead of the file scan operator. Does that address your concern? Any other questions regarding project one? All right, so let's uh, move on. Yes? Do you have any hints on like, uh, the vertical, uh, what do you say, uh, the query into the logical plan? Because you have to follow the exact query at first. Yes. Then understand, you can use scan operator, selection operator, and one operator, or a combination of that. So would you have the query first entirely and then use flags and based upon the flags? What do you mean by first the query in? Uh, so it's like, not, uh, in this scenario, uh, I was a subjoint of select query. Mm -hmm. so that means I am using selection operator instead of a scan operator at the base, at the bottom. OK. So, so, so I need to, what do you say, find uh, uh, the operators in such a way as to stick to my logical plan. So when you, presumably, if you're doing this translate, when you're doing this translation, um, JSQL parser has, I believe it's called from item, uh, has a from item which represents either a relation, uh, nested subquery, I think there's one other possible case, but let, let's consider those two. Or union, maybe it's a union. Um, let's consider those two. If you write your code as a translation. So I can translate from uh, a, a from item into one of these relational operator instances. Uh, if I'm expecting to get back a file scan operator from there, yeah, sure, that's, that's going to be a problem. But if all, if all I'm expecting to get back is an operator, just any kind of operator, uh, you shouldn't need to do anything too complex uh, to, to do this translation. Does that address your concern? You still have to initiate the scan Two operators, right? right. So uh, in 
JC equal parser, I believe it's uh, join. So join take, gives you a type of join and then has another from item on the right hand side. So you start with the one from item, then you take your join and let's build this up recursively. Uh, where is my eraser? So you've got your So we're starting with this. We've got a from item of some sort, and then we've got a join, which consists of S in this case. Now, presumably somewhere in your code you have something that takes a from item and translates it into a operator. If that's a file scan operator, great. If it's a nested relation, you can call this thing recursive. All right, so we have our box here. This is some kind of operator that represents the first from item. Now we've got a series of joins. Take the first join, and it's a join, so we can const construct a join between whatever operator we have on, currently on the stack and whatever new thing we constructed. Again, black box. Now you'll note, this is also an operator. So if we have more joins, let's say T, this whole thing now becomes our black box. So whatever we were joining with previously, now we can build a new join operator on top of that. Does that kind of get at what you're asking? Yes? Professor, could you implement group by operator and aggregate operator in one or we should implement it separately? The reference implementation, uh, in the reference implementation, they're implemented separately because, but they share a lot of code. So there's a unifying, there's a couple of uh, pieces of code that actually do the aggregate computation that are shared between them, uh, sort of uni utility code uh, that's instantiated once. Uh, but there are actually two, from a practical standpoint, there are actually two operators. Um, this is actually uh, one of the distinctions, one of the cases where there's a distinction in the reference implementation between the logical and the physical plan. So the physical plan has two separate operators. The logical plan, because it doesn't actually have to uh, perform any computation, has, uh, treats it as a single operator. Um, so I've mentioned this to a couple of people. If you're having, having trouble understanding the, difficult, uh, the distinction between the logical and the physical plan, um, don't worry about it too much. Forget the logical plan. Um, it will make sense in project two, and uh, it shouldn't be too hard to add it in after the fact. But the, uh, basically, there's a couple of cases where it makes, it's uh, simple to represent a non-group by aggregate, aggregate with no group by columns, but the because the implementation differs, uh, you actually want to have two separate representations in the physical plan. Does, does that address your concern? Yes. So the question is, is there a difference between a hash, using a integer as a hash map key and using a string as a hash map key? What do you think? So from a practical standpoint, what would the difference be between uh, using an integer and a string? Uh, string is a, a hash map. Key. 
So if I want to look up a value in a hash map, um, or look up which entry a particular uh, hash value uh, maps to, what do I need to, uh, what are the steps to get me there? Okay, so you pass in an integer, but uh, what happens to that integer? How do you figure out uh, integer 42 goes to hash bucket 12? What kind of computation is involved here? Okay, so you apply the hash function to an integer. Um, now, how big is an integer? Or there's actually several different answers, um, but it's uh, some number of bytes, uh, one, two, four, eight. Yeah, uh, one, two, four, eight. How long is a string? It varies. So to compute the, uh, the hash function of an integer, computing the hash function of an integer is a constant time operation. Computing the hash function of a string uh, varies depending on the length of the string. Uh, how about integer comparison? How many, uh, what's the time complexity of an integer comparison? Integer one equals integer two. Uh, how long does it take a computer to compute that? Constant time. How about a string? String one equals string two. Length of, so it depends on the length of the string if you're doing a string comparison. Uh, so to answer your question, a hash function, uh, a hash lookup takes two stages. Uh, first, you need to compute the hash value of whatever it is that you're hashing. Then you need to find the correct hash bucket, and within that hash bucket, you need to find, uh, you need to uh, compare to see if the value that's stored in that hash bucket is actually what you're looking for. Uh, and that tends to be more expensive for strings uh, simply because strings are bigger. Uh, you need to do both an equality and a, and a hash computation. Uh, to answer your question specifically, um, the answer is uh, it depends. Uh, what language you're using, how, what kind of string representation you're using, what kind of hash function you're using, uh, a whole bunch of different uh, factors play into this. So uh, if you're looking for a specific case, um, I encourage you to try it out. Try out both, see which one runs faster. Does that address your concern? Yeah. All right, last call. All right, cool. So, um, on Monday, we talked about uh, building various kinds of tree indexes. Uh, there are, uh, we talked specifically about two different kinds of uh, tree indexes, uh, ISAM indexes and B plus trees. And sort of the key observation was that in both cases, uh, what the index structure was trying to do was increase the, um, the sort of fan out of our search process. Uh, by loading one page in, we can get uh, k different or, uh, partition values into memory. And because of that, we, can, uh, we only need log, k, log base k uh, steps to get to uh, a specific value that we're looking for. Now, there was a, a question that uh, came up during the talk. Uh, during last lecture, uh, how do we take advantage of um, bulk processes? Uh, so if we're trying, if we have a huge number of data values, how do we sort of bring them into the um, the B plus tree and make sure that uh, sort of rebuild the B plus tree more efficiently? Uh, so there's a very simple process uh, that you can use to uh, to build the the B plus tree. That's quite nicely illustrated in the book, uh, just because I can do animations here. I uh, figured I'd run through it quickly. Uh, the idea is basically that you build the tree uh, starting left deep. 
so you're going to take uh, an, a non-leaf node, and you're going to start populating it as much as possible. And essentially, by scanning over this and splitting the nodes exactly like you would in a normal B plus tree, so after I insert my third node, I need to split again. And then I keep inserting new values. Eventually, I need to split. I keep inserting values. Eventually, I need to split. And if you just keep doing this, you'll end up with essentially just inserting values in sorted order. You'll end up with a B plus tree that is not only, um, that is not only uh, correct, but you'll end up with a properly balanced B plus tree. So nice little uh, trick to be aware of. If you insert items into a B plus tree in sorted order, uh, it's sort of the minimal computation, uh, the, the way to build a B plus tree with minimal computation required. OK, um, right. So one other thing that uh, came up in the last lecture that I wanted to get at was what happens if you have uh, multiple keys. So if I, have, uh, if I have two different keys that I'd like to be able to look up, uh, I can sort my data on both of those keys. So uh, basically, I create a priority order of the, over the two keys, uh, sort first on uh, A, and then values of A that are equal get sorted on B. Um, and this kind of index allows us to do uh, quite a range of lookups on both keys. So if we have an index that's sorted in this particular order, uh, would that allow us to find uh, values of A that are less than 3? You guys need some coffee or something? Seriously, though. Will this? If I have uh, something that's sorted first on A, and then for values of A that are identical, uh, I distinguish between them by sorting on B. So will this allow me to find values of A that are less than 3 efficiently? Yes. Thank you. All right. What about uh, if I'm looking for a specific pair, A, B? Uh, namely, in this case, uh, three, the, the tuple 3, 2. Will this work? Yes. Uh, what about if I'm looking for uh, all values of B that are less than 2, where A is equal to 3? And how about this one, uh, where A is less than 3, but B is less than 2? No, I'm hearing some no's. Why? Yes. Right, so I'd have to scan over all of the values of A that are less than 3, but I might get multiple values of B, um, including ones that are not necessarily equal to 2. So as a general rule, uh, this works very nicely as long as you have equality predicates all the way down uh, until uh, the first. If all of the predicates that you're looking for are equality predicates, until the last one in uh, the, the lowest priority um, attribute in, in this order. OK, great. Now that you're a little more uh, wakened, uh, woken up, I'd like to get to the first major topic of today's lecture, which is uh, how do we actually apply this, uh, this knowledge? So how do we, we have these indexes. We know that they allow us to find uh, values for certain uh, predicates, how do we actually uh, use them? Now, the simplest case is when we have a selection predicate sitting right on top of an index. That's easy. Uh, but what if we have a slightly more complex uh, predicate? So, for example, this. If I have a selection predicate between uh, C1 and C2, and let's say C, uh, C1 is something that we have an index for. Any thoughts? So can we potentially simplify this expression? Rewrite it into, uh, 
into a Ah, okay. So if I have a select of one expression and another expression, or one condition and another condition, I can potentially rewrite that as two separate selection predicates. Now, if I have a uh, if I have an index that satisfies uh, that works well for C1, then I can just use that. So there's a number of as we'll get into a little bit more on Monday. Uh, there's a lot of these rewrite rules that you can take advantage of uh, to make your expressions more uh, suitable for the kind of indexes and the kind of uh, data representations that you have. And so I wanted to go over uh, today a couple of those uh, just because they're uh, particularly amenable to indexing. So in general, if you have a selection predicate uh, over a conjunction or an AND, of a couple of different predicates, you can split that apart into multiple selection predicates. And that's an important one for taking advantage of, um, of uh, indexes. Uh, by the way, the, uh, there's a term for this. Uh, the way that you access a data value is typically referred to as an access path. So what about this one? Uh, so here's a conjunction. Um, what if we have an index on uh, attribute A of R. Can we use this? Uh, can we use that index to satisfy this, even though there's an and in there? Yes, I heard a yes. Why would you say that? This class is too big. I can't actually identify who speaks up. Start pointing randomly. So, will this work? Yes, okay. Speak up. Why? Yes. Okay, so you can you can split this up. Uh, can you use the index index to actually help you with both of those conditions? Yes. How? Okay, so you're going to select all of the values uh, where A is, is less than 1. But uh, one observation is that the results that you'll be getting back, how would you be getting those back? So uh, I, I look for, uh, what is this, A is, I, I start at 1. I use my uh, index uh, to find the first tuple where A is greater than 1. <coughs> Now I keep scanning over the tuples, which presumably are sorted in order of A. Do I have to scan the entire relation? No. I can actually stop because I know that they're in sorted order. This um, a tree index allows us to pick out uh, tuples not just uh, that satisfy a single greater than predicate, but actually tuples that fall into a, a specific range. All right, one last one. How about this? What if we had an index of some sort on SB? Could we use that to improve the performance of this query? Well, in the last case, oh, I see. Uh, so you could potentially, uh, in this case, the reason that belongs to, uh, in works is because it's uh, a range of values. It would be a lot harder to evaluate this. Although you're on the right track. It would, how would, um, more precisely, how would you evaluate that belongs to? So if you had a, uh, a data structure that allowed you, allowed you to quickly look up specific elements of SB, which helpfully an index is, uh, how could you, so how would you 
let's bring it all together. How would you uh, actually compute this query? What do you mean by hash join? Great. Um, basically, I'm asking you to uh, explain what you, uh, rather than naming the algorithm, can you uh, uh, explain how the, the algorithm that you're suggesting would work? Okay, so uh, which values of r.b? All of this has basically been said. I'm just asking someone to tie it all together. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Bingo. So if you're... Uh, we can compare this kind of to a nested loop join, where we've got um, a whole bunch of values of R and a whole bunch of values of S. And in this case, what we're looking for, we know uh, when we visit a specific uh, tuple in R, we know it's going to map to uh, values of uh, values in S that have a specific value of S dot B. So rather than trying to loop over every tuple in S, we just use the index to look over uh, to look up the specific tuples that we're interested in. Um, as an aside, who keeps pushing the button? There's a button or something. But... No. All right. Uh, so as as an aside. Um, what would be the working set size and the I.O. cost of this particular uh, algorithm? Let's take that one, at a, one step at a time. What's the working set size? One size of the index? Okay, so if you can keep the entire index in memory, this becomes incredibly efficient. Um, in the worst case, you only need one tuple, I heard that. Uh, and in the best case, you, keep, you can keep the entire index in memory, and this gets really nice performance. Uh, what about the I.O. cost? Okay, so in the worst case, how many I.O.s? The size of R.B. Okay, so in the worst, yeah. Um, so you'll need at least however many IOs it takes to read an R.B. And then in the absolute worst case, for every R.B, you'll need to read, um, use the index to read one tuple, uh, one page, I'm, excuse me, uh, from S. In the best case, however, you'll probably be doing some caching, so that's not going to be quite as bad. Yes. Um, okay. If I, have, if I have one tuple of R dot B and I'm looking for matching tuples of S dot B, so how does it work if I have, um, let's say I'm looking for a value in S dot B Uh, completely right, um, but how would that compare to this, where I need to, so in nested loop join, I have to hit every single tuple in S. With the index nested loop join, I can find, I can specifically zoom in on just those tuples of S that are relevant for that, that particular R dot B. 
Are you? Go ahead. So if I have um, if I have a, a query select star from s where s dot b equals three, can I use an index to find that? Or can I use an index on s dot b to find that? So essentially, what this is doing is it's running that same query over and over, it's just replacing three with whatever the value is of r dot b in the tuple that I'm currently looking at. So if tuple, read tuple one of r, and then do a lookup for all sbs that match that value of rb. Does that address your concern? So how does this, by the way, compare to um, hash join? Something to keep in mind. Um, we'll be getting back to that in a couple of lectures. If Hallway wants to hear the lecture, sure. All right. Um, 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 um. All right, uh, this actually, we, I am running a little behind where I thought I was, so let's take a quick break, and then when we come back, uh, we'll get into uh, hashing, hash-based indexes. Hopefully that'll round out the rest of the lecture. Uh, so be back here in, at let's say, three, uh, sorry, 543. Uh, Alrighty. So up till now we've been talking predominantly about tree-based indexes. Now I'd like to get into uh, a little bit more on uh, using hash functions uh, for indexing. So uh, just as a quick recap, can anyone tell me what a hash function is? Yes. Given an it, uh, the answer is given a uh, given an input, it generates a unique uh, value. I'm going to disagree with you on one term you use there. Uh, unique, um, a deterministic uh, input value. Uh, that is to say, if you give it the same input, it will generate the same output. Uh, but the one thing, and this, uh, this gets a lot of people, uh, is that the result, the, the value you get back, is not guaranteed to be unique. In fact, in general, it won't be unique. Um, that's, in fact, one of the things that uh, we'll be dealing with uh, when discussing the hash, uh, several hash-based hash indexes. So um, there's a couple of different uh, types of hash functions. Uh, there, uh, MD5 is pretty commonly used. Uh, there's a handful of other ones that are uh, used specifically for hash tables. Uh, this is really not sort of the, the main focus of, uh, of this lecture. There's implementations of hash functions all over the place. Uh, if you're interested in this, I encourage you to uh, search Wikipedia, there's references all over the place. Uh, but the, the core takeaway is that a hash function is a function that uh, if you give it a value, you get back the same value all the time. And the value that, that you get back is, uh, for some definition of the following, uh, random. So uh, we talked about uh, tree indexes in the context of sorting your data, uh, taking your data or uh, sorting in it sorting it in a particular order, and then using the tree, uh, tree structure uh, to uh, essentially point into that sorted uh, order. Uh, hash takes a slightly different, hash-based indexing takes a slightly different approach. Uh, rather than sorting your data, it partitions your data. Um, so use a hash function uh, to figure out 
which uh, bin or bucket or billion different terms for this, but which bin uh, your data falls into, and then you allocate uh, a reference to that bin in some very well-defined location. So <coughs> you can use this uh, to essentially build a sort of index structure over your data based on this sort of binning. Um, what are what might be some uh, trade-offs between using uh, sorting and using uh, partitioning or binning uh, to organize your data? Yes. So sorting your data is more expensive. Uh, n log n versus how long would it take to partition? Okay, so it'll be on order of n. Um, so one answer is uh, building a, 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 a sorted index is much more expensive. Any other thoughts or any other, uh, anything to add to that? Yes. I want to take more space than actual uh, data there. So a hash, uh, a hash index will uh, be larger and yeah, yeah so uh, you might need to allocate, because the bins need to be in regular positions, and we'll get into that in a moment, uh, you might need to allocate space for bins that don't actually have any content uh, in them. Uh, what about lookups? How expensive is a lookup in, in a hash function, or a hash table, sorry? Constant time. What about a tree index? Log in. Okay, so there's there's another trade-off. Uh, hash index is typically going to have a slightly faster lookup time. Uh, there's one other major, major distinction between these two uh, that is also quite important. Uh, yes? Okay, so hash tables are easier to update as well because in a, a tree index, you have to change the, uh, the entire parent structure where is in a hash table, you only need to change individual elements. Um, in memory, that is true. We'll get into a little bit uh, more on updating hash tables, uh, hopefully today as well. Um, so what about, uh, what kind of predicates can we use in each of these cases? Yes. Exactly. So the one last uh, the one last thing to consider is that a B tree, uh, sorry, a, a tree index uh, supports inequality predicates, whereas a hashing um, a hash index only supports uh, equality lookups. So because you're you're looking for a specific bin, because the data isn't stored in any particular order, uh, a less than comparison uh, isn't supported by a hash index. All right, so we pretty much just covered most of that. Um, all right, so how do we actually implement this? Uh, here's basically the, the simplest possible hash table that you might imagine. Uh, I have a region of memory, a contiguous region of memory, uh, that has uh, n hash buckets. And here I've numbered them 0 to n minus 1. I have my hash function, and uh, I can take a hash function that produces an arbitrarily, arbitrarily large number and uh, reduce it to an equivalently random number, and also an equivalently deterministic number, by using the modulus operator. Uh, show of hands, who uh, is familiar with that? Modulus? OK. Um, if you aren't familiar with this, I encourage you to uh, read up on percent in C, Java, and just about every other language. Uh, it becomes, it will be, that's an amazing operator. It does so much. Um, long story short, it's basically the remainder after division. Uh, but it d just does so much. Uh, anyway, so you have a contiguous region of hash uh, buckets, and any time I get a new key, uh, I use my hash function uh, modulo n to figure out which bucket uh, this, uh, that particular key falls into. 
and then all of my data gets stored in that bucket. Uh, if I'm doing this on disk, each bucket is potentially one or more pages. Uh, if I run out of space in the, uh, in the bucket, well, I need to allocate some extra pages. I can do that kind of like the, the tree indexes. So create a pointer and a linked list of, of over, overflow pages. All right, so here's a question. How do we pick n? What's a good value of n to pick? Or better yet, what, is, uh, what happens if we pick an n that's too small? Yes? Uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. The collisions might occur. What happens with a collision? Okay, so if uh, you pick an n that's too small, you end up with lots of overflow pages. Uh, what if we pick an n that's too big? <coughs> you end up with a lot of uh, blank pages and a lot of wasted memory. Um, as an aside, this also means uh, if you have a lot more space allocated, uh, you get worse performance at higher levels of the memory hierarchy, uh, worse cache uh, your caches, your data doesn't fit in caches, and, and everything goes uh, gets even worse. So, uh, basically, long story short, you need to pick uh, a value of n, an index size that is uh, big enough so that you don't get um, that you don't get lots of overflow pages, but at the same time, small enough so that you're not wasting uh, ex uh, lots of memory and getting really poor I/O performance. Uh, now, this is an incredibly difficult problem, and it depends very much on the data. Uh, and in a typical database, uh, you don't have the data beforehand. Uh, so you really don't have much uh, many tools at your disposal uh, to pick an appropriate n. Uh, what if we pick a wrong n? What can we do about it? Yes? Restructure. You can re, uh, restructure. What do you mean by that? Okay, so uh, when you say restructure, you mean rebuild from scratch? Okay, so one, uh, one potential solution would be to simply, if you pick the, uh, the wrong value for n, uh, you rebuild the hash map. Uh, what would be a downside to doing that? Yeah, so this is uh, extremely, extremely expensive. Uh, so simply resizing the hash map in general uh, using the structure that I just described doesn't necessarily work in all cases. So what we'd like to have is, and this gets back to, uh, God, I'm horrible with, uh, this gets back to a uh, question that came earlier, which was, um, what, uh, we'd like to have a data structure that allows us to uh, re resize the hash map uh, dynamically. And in the last, uh, well, still got 20 minutes. Um, and so what I'd like to talk about now are two specific uh, data structures that are designed uh, to be resizable. The, uh, these are, these two data structures are known as extendable hashes and linear hashes. So, as we just said, what happens when a, uh, a hash table gets too full? One option is to simply double the size of the hash map, and uh, because you have two twice as many buckets, hopefully that gives you enough space. Uh, as we said, this is expensive. So one potential solution, uh, rather than trying to double the size of the entire hash map, rather than trying to copy all of the data in that hash map, uh, what we can do is uh, create a sort of pointer structure that is smaller, easier to store, easier to manage, and rather than doubling the entire hash map, what we can do is just double that sort of pointer structure, uh, or a directory structure, sorry. 
So the, the idea behind an extendable hash is that you have this sort of separate directory structure that identifies the location of a data page uh, that corresponds to a given hash value. Now there are two there are magic constants that are involved in this data structure, sorry, not magic constants, uh, two uh, variables, uh, for lack of a better word, that are used in this data structure. One uh, that I'm going to call the global depth, or GD, and one that I'm going to call the local depth, or LD. Uh, the global depth is associated with the directory, and the local depth is associated with each individual data page. So here I have uh, four data pages, A, B, C, D, and each of them has a local depth, in this case, of two. Now, the, the depth is going to be uh, the number of bits of the hash, uh, the hash function, uh, that, we, uh, that we are going to use to distinguish uh, individual data pages. So recall, we use the modulus, uh, the, the remainder after division, uh, to figure out, uh, to come up with a smaller hash value. So if I, well, if I have two bits, how many directory entries can I create? Four, right. So uh, two to the power of two in this case is four. So I have four directory entries right here. Now the idea of an extendable hash is that you can uh, increase the, the number of buckets without d copying all of your data. So in this case, I'm trying to insert uh, a value 20, which in my little example here has a hash value of 1100. Uh, that would normally go, in this case, uh, into bucket A. So the last two bits, global depth is two, the last two bits fall into uh, the first hash bucket, 00. And so now, hash bucket A is full, and I need to split that into two uh, new hash buckets. Now normally I'd have to copy the entire table, all of the, the data in this entire table, uh, but in this case all I want to do is copy A. So rather than copying all of my entire data set, uh, what I can do is create additional directory pages and fill in pointers back to uh, data value uh, to the, the pages that, uh, that aren't getting modified. So in this case, A is getting split. In this case, A is getting split, whereas B, C, and D are remaining unchanged. So I can create four new directory entries, and the only, because the only one that's getting split is A, I can basically just copy the remaining pointers intact. Now after I repartition the data in this, uh, in bucket A, I part, uh, essentially I take another bit of the, uh, of the hash function and I use that to distinguish uh, between whether it stays in A or whether it goes into this new hash bucket. So you can see uh, the value 20 has, uh, the third bit is one, so it's going to go into the new uh, hash bucket. And I can assign uh, a new identifier to this. And I need to now update all of the variables that I'm keeping track of. So because I've added four more entries, now I have eight entries, which is three bits worth of, uh, worth of index. So I set my global depth to three, so three, uh, three bits of, of data. Similarly, in order to distinguish between A and A2, I need three bits worth of data. So I set their local depths to three. However, in the case of B, C, and D, they're still pointing, uh, they're still storing data for both, uh, so B in this case is storing data for 0, 0, 1, as well as 1, 0, 1. Both of those point to the same data page. So I only need two bits to distinguish, uh, to identify which values go into B. 
And I can do this, I can continually do this. Um, so if I want to add uh, a new value, let's say 31, that would nominally go into, uh, into uh, bucket B. However, because uh, B's local depth is less than the global depth, uh, sorry for the animation there, because B's local depth is smaller than the global depth, I know I don't actually need to split the entire directory, I just need to split B specifically. So I do the same thing that I did with A. I repartition the contents of B and everything works. So any questions on this? Yes. So in this example, the hash function for uh, the hash function for a applied to a produces something 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 one zero zero. So before splitting, I'm only considering the last two bits of that zero zero, and zero zero maps to that particular entry. So I find that entry, I follow the pointer, and four was there. Now the global depth, uh, after the split, the global depth becomes three. I need to consider three bits. So it's something, 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 one, zero, zero. And so one, zero, zero is going to point to the right place. Um, sorry, I, did, uh, I glossed over this. The, um, the way that the partitioning happens is based on the third bit. So all of the things that map to something, 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 one, zero, zero, go in A2. Everything that's uh, something, 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 zero, 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 go into just regular A. Does that address your concern? Yes. So this is effectively simulating doubling the size of the hash table. Um, in effect, I am doubling the size of the hash table. This kind of represents uh, the directory pages, kind of rep directory page represents the hash table. Um, so I'm doubling the size, but the way this is uh, set up, I don't need to actually copy the data as long as I have a way of getting back to the original data. So what's happening is that um, why I need to copy uh, all of the, the pointers is so that I have a way of getting to the data that I'm looking for. The global depth tells me which row I need to look at. Um, let me put that another way. Uh, after the split happens, how many bits do I need to look at to figure out which entry uh, I should be looking up? So let's, let's say the... Uh, I have something that hashes to uh, something, 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 uh, zero, zero, zero. Which, which of these entries should I look at? Zero, zero, zero. All right, what about um, if it hashes to something, 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 one, zero, one? Yeah, uh, so I need to look at row one, zero, one. One zero one would point to something. Does that address your concern, or? If the pages are empty, or. Um, so the, the problem is that there are some values in B that would potentially map to, uh, their hash function 
while the global depth is two, some of these values are going to have uh, entries that are uh, something, something, something. All of them end in zero, one. But there might be some that end in one, zero, one, and some that end in uh, zero, zero, one. And until we've partitioned them, until we've actually gone through the elements of B and actually split B itself, both of those sets of elements are residing in the same page. Um, so previously we had 121, 5, 13, and 31 living in B before this uh, recent split. So if I wanted to look up, let's say, uh, 1, which has a hash of one zero zero, this example. Uh, how would I go about doing that? So why the last two bits? If the global depth is three, why? Uh, or if I if I have eight entries in my my hash table here. Okay. Maybe I'm misunderstanding your, your question. Um, when is the copy, uh, which copy are you referring to? Uh, no, the links which are set up, right? Uh, when the global depth, the links which are set up, which all the links we set up for buckets which are there, are only when it's not particular thing, it's within a certain into a bucket. Only then, uh, the particular uh, thing can be. So the reason for setting up a link is that you may have already inserted elements that should be linked. So prior to setting up that link, I already have, uh, I forget which, uh, 31, yeah, 31. So 1 and 21 were both in there. And if I used my hash function, I'd find this, I, if, I, if I tried to do a lookup on 1, I'd run into this point. For C and D, why should links be set up? Because in this case, nothing is getting inserted in the end. So at this stage, I, I completely agree. Nothing has been inserted into B at this stage. Now, if I want to do a lookup of one, now remember, one has a hash function of zero of something something something. One zero zero. Where would I look? One zero zero. Here. Uh, sorry. Uh, one zero one. Excuse me. Uh, I'd look here, right? And what if this pointer wasn't here? What would I do? Can you look at? You can look at the zero zero one. You're completely right. Um, you can actually. You, you are completely right. Um, congratulations, you've just beat the uh, authors of the book with uh, an improved version of this algorithm. So the improvement is that you don't need to copy all of the, the links. If I'm understanding you correctly, if the not, uh, if you assume that all of the links are initialized to some null value, uh, you may actually need to initialize them to null. And if that's the case, you don't get any necessarily any uh, savings from this. But uh, if you can assume that newly allocated uh, pointers have null values in them, then um, the idea, if I'm uh, correct me if I'm misunderstanding you, the idea is that you trace Whenever you hit a null value, you essentially reduce the global, the effective global depth by one, and so you trace back to the the previous step. Is that a, um, so? Uh, if you can assume the cost of a memory wipe 
is probably not going to be that much uh, cheaper than the cost of a copy. Um, but if you know that the memory is already wiped, you can save yourself a memory copy. I completely agree. Yes. Uh, what do you mean? Sorry? The hash function is supposed to work in a constant time. Mm -hmm. So if, if I am looking up for three bits, a hash function uh, for the global is, suppose the global uh, is 0, 0, 001. Yeah. So I can look up into 0, 0, 001 if we have uh, all these memory locations in a constant time. But if I don't have this, then I have to trace back, I have to make a call back. So the call back is going to cost me the length of the. If uh, if I don't have what? Suppose you don't. Uh, suppose uh, one to zero is pointing to uh, someone who are working with non value computing. One one uh, one one zero. Okay. Yes. Oh, sorry. So the the pointer itself would be null in this in the proposed algorithm, if I understand correctly. The, this point there wouldn't be a point. No. So if a pointer is null. Yeah. Then I'm again going to do. That. That. Then you go up to uh, one 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 one. So, so I am making multiple now. So it's not a constant time for a hash function. Yeah, that's correct. But this is only a uh, an outside case. Um, you're right. There there are trade uh, there are a number of trade offs in this. You're basically paying the cost of an extra memory lookup uh, as opposed to the cost of a memory copy that may not actually be relevant. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, given that we have five minutes, I'd like to continue. But please, I encourage you to discuss this on Piazza, because there are cases to be made for both sides. Um, all right. Cool. I'm excited. All right. OK, uh, so we've kind of gone over this. Uh, deleting kind of works pretty much the same way. The uh, only difference is that rather than, uh, rather than splitting buckets, you might end up merging buckets together. Um, all right, so we had our intermission. OK, cool. So the other algorithm that we talked about was, oh, sorry, the other algorithm that I mentioned, and I'm gonna, this one's actually a lot simpler, is called linear hashing. So once again, the idea is let's, uh, let's split the, the hash table, but let's split it incrementally, little by little, rather than all at once. So in a little uh, diagram here, we have the hash table essentially split according to um, split into two parts. Now this uh, this algorithm work or this data structure, I should say, uh, the algorithm for the data structure works in rounds. And at the beginning of each round, we have a normal hash table. So here I have eight entries in my hash table. In order to differentiate between entries, how many bits do I need uh, if I have eight, eight entries? Three. Great. How did you get that? Log in. Good. Um, so what's going to happen is that I, uh, at the start of a given round, I'm going to have a power of two buckets. Now, when I want to do a... Uh, lookup, and this actually kind of works sort of like the, the algorithm you're, you're proposing, um, that uh, when I want to look up a value, let's say k, um, and I have a, uh, my hash function produces uh, 1, 0, 0, I look up 1, 0, 0. There's a, uh, okay. 
so the data structure also has uh, a variable associated with it uh, called the next pointer. And the next pointer points to uh, a specific entry in, in the hash table. The idea is basically that all of the values before the next pointer have been split. Everything after the next pointer, but sort of up to that, um, that point where I ended last round, has not been split. So in this case, the next pointer is pointing at two, which means that the first two buckets have already been split. So if I want to get uh, an element that would normally fall into the first two buckets, I need four bits. If I want to find something that falls, uh, that would fall into the remaining eight buckets, I only need the first three bits. So if uh, four uh, comes after the next pointer, so I can uh, look it up normally. Uh, if I'm looking for something that comes before the next pointer, then I need to use an extra bit to differentiate whether I want to get go into this batch or this batch. Now, the idea of a, the idea behind this is that periodically, whenever there's uh, free resources or whenever you have um, overflow pages, basically using some heuristics, uh, which they're uh, so, so application dependent that I really can't go uh, provide any useful information about them. Uh, but the, uh, the idea is that when your heuristics tell you, uh, you perform a split. And that's basically going to involve incrementing the next counter and then taking uh, the, the contents of one page, partitioning it, uh, splitting it up into two pages, and then uh, re-adding uh, that new page to the end of your, your hash table. Um, like I said, the heurist the specific heuristic uh, for this, there's a number of them. Uh, I'm not going to get into these because I have about 30 seconds left. But uh, basically, this is a good way of sort of incrementally partitioning your hash table. Uh, so with that, are there any uh, questions? All right. Uh, project 1, checkpoint, or checkpoint 1 due on Sunday night. And um, good luck.